Uh, well, joining me now is the former Tory advisor and PR consultant Ian Anderson. Also joining us, Sarah Lyle from the New Economics Foundation and Ian Robinson, partner at immigration law firm uh, Fragoman. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Ian Anderson, to you first. Um, in terms of the response from the, the business community, I'm sure any cut to corporation taxes is generally going to be welcomed. But are we perhaps seeing uh, signs of a, a more interventionist Conservative administration uh, than perhaps we've become used to? Oh, y yes, Neil. I mean, the, the first thing is every Tory manifesto always wants to talk about the economy and a stable economy. We got that today. But the thing that business is really focusing on is two things. One is what she said about Brexit frankly didn't spook the markets at all there. We heard it before. But also, yet she says that there's not Mayism. Actually, there's quite a new political credo that's being laid out today, and that's about a muscular state that will intervene in markets that are not, uh, in, in her mind, in her government's mind, uh, working effectively. That's the theme. That's what business is going to have its eyes on uh, for the rest of the campaign and likely when she wins. I mean, ideologically, and this is no Thatcherite manifesto, is it? We, we have heard in the past from uh, various Conservatives that the markets are the, uh, the solution to all ills. I mean, that's clearly not the case for Theresa May. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of in the, like the relative past. And you, know, you go back to Disraelism, you go back to the government of Edward Heath. He talked about the unacceptable face of capitalism. Perhaps we're seeing a reprise of a very long-standing one nation Tory tradition. If that's the case, people like me will be very happy. Um, Ian Robinson, in terms of what we're hearing uh, as regards immigration, frankly, we've had it before, haven't we, reducing it to tens of thousands, and it, it never quite happened for Theresa May when she was Home Secretary. But, but in terms of employers, uh, there does appear that there's going to be a burden shifted onto them if they want to get the skills they need to be profitable. Yeah, that's right. And tens of thousands, we've heard, the Home Office have never quite got close to that target. For employers, it's less about a burden and more about cost. It's going to, it's going to become incredibly, incredibly expensive just to bring in somebody uh, to fill a skills gap. Um, but in terms of uh, those businesses that, 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 that need the skills to survive in this, well, let's be fair about it, incredibly competitive marketplace and incredibly difficult economic times, I mean, is it right that employers should be, should be taxed for something as, uh, as simple as you know, filling, filling the holes in their employment that they need? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't sit comfortably, and it's not something that employers particularly appreciate. I, uh, I was doing the sums on the way over here, and if you had a, a worker coming over with a, a partner and three children for five years, in government fees alone, it would cost around thirty-one thousand pounds for them for them to get the visa. That that just feels like an exorbitant exorbitant amount. It, it's already sixteen thousand, so it's already very expensive. Uh, well, let's bring in Sarah Lyle, who's um, social policy lead, of course, at the New Economics Foundation. Um, in terms of uh, the problems with social care, those are, uh, those are well described. Um, but in terms of the solution to all of this, twofold, that uh, removing the winter fuel allowance from uh, the wealthier end of the, pen uh, end of the pensioner spectrum, uh, but also uh, the idea that we are going to be able to pay after we die from, from our estate, if it's worth uh, over £100,000. I mean, do the sums add up? Well, this is a very, there's a very, and they've taken the issue of the ageing population very seriously in this manifesto, which is great to see. Um, there are two big uncertainties in the funding model proposed. Um, one is that we don't know how people are going to respond to the £100,000 threshold. Will they try and pass on their homes to their children before they reach old age to prevent um, falling ab above that threshold? Um, and the other is that it's very reliant on the housing market, which is inherently unstable. And social, social care is incredibly important. We're all going to need it in later, in la later life. And it's, it's just a bit too important to leave open to those kinds of uncertainties. Uh, but Sarah, the, the, there is a curiosity about this funding of social care, which has been identified by uh, the FT amongst others. And that is this, that if you were to die suddenly from a heart attack or from, you know, from an accident of some kind, uh, all that you wanted to pass on to your children would go directly to them. If, however, you suffer from a degenerative illness or an illness requiring treatment over weeks, months, perhaps even years, the amount of money that you can pass on uh, to your children is rather much less. It doesn't strike some people speaking on social media today that that's entirely fair. 
There are certainly concerns, and Andrew Dillnott has been raising concerns about the fairness of the policy to, to people who have very high care needs that will be very expensive. But one thing that the, the manifesto certainly doesn't address is that state-funded system that those who fall beneath the 100,000 threshold will be reliant on. And we still know that that is incredibly underfunded. We, what we need is a very stable and secure kind of funding. And while the manifesto takes that issue seriously, it doesn't quite go far enough to achieve it. Um, Ian Anderson, to turn to you just for a second, what do you define Mayism as? Having read this uh, manifesto, having uh, written about it, having read, I'm sure, uh, multiple column inches uh, about it, I mean, do we have a better idea of exactly what uh, Theresa May's underlying ideology philosophy might be? Yeah, it's essentially um, about listening beyond the bubble. Uh, it is about intervening. You know, she kind of gave us her credo when she stepped when she stood on the steps of Downing Street for the first time back in July. You know, a government that is on the side of middle, hard-working Britain, if you like, not those um, around boardroom tables and, and top tables. That's carried uh, as a thought right into the heart of this manifesto. She talked about it in her party conference speech, but this is actually a much, much more detailed prospectus than I think many of us had expected from her. People had expected a very, very um, high-level document, almost in the clouds. It's very grounded. It's got lots of ideas, it fleshes out that credo and it's saying after Brexit, after that vote, I'm on the side of the people in the country, not those in the bubble. Ian Robinson, um, are you in any way surprised, given the, the poll lead that the Conservative leader is enjoying at the moment, that we haven't uh, for once had a figure from the right actually standing up and, and defending net immigration to the United Kingdom as, a, as an overwhelmingly good thing? I, I, I'm not necessarily surprised, but I, I'm slightly disappointed. I mean, immigration, it has to be controlled. Everyone knows that we need controls around immigration, but it shouldn't be uh, presented consistently as a problem. There, there are lots of positives to immigration. It just needs to be managed uh, sensibly. And, and said all that, a final word from you on, on social care. I mean, just if the next government doesn't get to grips with this, if the next government uh, rescinds its responsibilities, we don't see these promises being lived up to, just how bad could it get? How much of a drain on the British economy will social care be in the not-too-distant future? Well, we have to remember that this isn't just a challenge of how much money we can put into the social care system, but actually where it goes and the structure of the system. And our analysis has shown that because of debt financing going on in some of the large chain providers, that 29% of the money that's going into residential care is actually going back to debt, debt repayments and to investors. So that's actually a leaky bucket that we've got of care delivery. And what, what's more, it affects the model of care that's being provided, which tends to be bigger scale, 30 to 40 bed residential homes, rather than the smaller scale, 10 to 20 homes, 10 to 20 bed homes. Um, and so really we have to address the, the care delivery model so that it's something people, uh, it's good for people receiving care and good for the staff who work in it, given that with an ageing population we're going to need many more people to go into the care profession, for it to be a good profession to pe for people to go into, one they feel valued in. Sarah Lyle, Ian Robinson, Ian Anderson, thanks all three for joining us, appreciate it.